Welcome to this week's program of uh, SEND, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Today our topic is Autism and Maximizing Career Options. But first I want to talk to our co-host, Will Burnick, about his shirt. Oh yeah, uh, this week's shirt is a Giants shirt to, prom to promote opening, Giants opening day, which was last, which was last Monday. They, they've won, they've won three World Series and they're going for a fourth. Yay. <laughs> really good. Did you wear it at the game, Will? I sure did. And I'm going to wear it to all the Giants games. Go Giants! <laughs> excellent, excellent. As mentioned, today our topic is autism and maximizing career options, and our first guest is uh, Mark Goodenough, a neurodiversity uh, career coach. Uh, Mark has a very extensive background. Uh, he taught at the Orion Com Academy in Moraga, a college prep school for students on the spectrum before starting his own business, Bright Options for the Learning Disabled, or BOLD. Additionally, he is the lead instructor for the Mount Diablo Unified School District's Transition Option Program, or TOPS, a four-day-per-week program that helps adults on the spectrum with job skills, independent living, community awareness and involvement, and related needs. He will return uh, to the University of California, Berkeley, this summer to continue leading the social skills team for Blue Camp, a summer program that teaches neurodiverse workers job skills and career preparation. Very extensive background indeed. Will, take it from there. Thank you, Keith. Sure. First question, how long have you worked in neurodiversity? Well, uh, I taught at Orion Academy. Uh, that started about 11 years ago. Uh, and actually, I, I, I often trace my neurodiverse background back to my grade school days when I went to a school called the Nueva School in Hillsboro. It's a school for kids that are gifted, but I see a lot of overlap between uh, folks on the spectrum and gifted people. And so in some ways, my experience with neurodiversity started way back in when I was in grade school, uh, being a student at a school that respected it. But as far as professionally, my time at Orion uh, was uh, about 11 years ago when I started. And then I've been doing bold and uh, working with tops uh, ever since. And what kind of disabilities do you work with? Uh, generally, people on the spectrum are related diagnosis. Uh, certainly, there's uh, you know if somebody if there's a lack of organization or a lack of impetus, there can be a, a number of uh, diagnoses, and in some cases, undiagnosed people who might have a need for services to give them a little bit of a boost. Do you work with in other cities? I work all around the Bay Area and actually uh, work with some people remotely, uh, clients who have moved on to colleges. Uh, I work with some that are in school in the South, uh, Southern California, as well as uh, there's a, I guess you would call it a, a client of mine who is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we work remotely as well. So all over the Bay Area and then uh, wherever the client is, we can certainly figure out a way via Skype or phone or, or email or uh, to stay in touch. What careers have you directed stu uh, adults to? Well, one of the big ones at Blue Camp uh, at Cal is helping them get ready to work with kids and to work at uh, summer camps. So that's certainly a career path that a lot of people like. Working with animals, uh, being able to be a veterinarian assistant uh, as a goal is certainly a big one. Working at uh, stores that deal with animals uh, is, a, is a big one. Also, getting uh, students ready to take the step from high school to a college or from a community college to a four-year school for an undergraduate degree. That's also part of it. Uh, other careers, gosh, uh, there have been a variety. Uh, training uh, people to get ready to, to work in restaurants, to be able to work in food service, to be able to work uh, on college campuses to work with foundations, uh, maybe doing some of the work uh, that is familiar to them in a foundational setting. Uh, those have all been options. And uh, what, how, how have you been involved out with disabilities outside the program? Uh, boy, uh, outside which program? The pro program you, you work in. Well, you know, I guess part of it is wanting to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake. Uh, wanting to, you know, be part of Ascend, wanting to be part of the Parents Educational Network, which is 
uh, a, a group here in San Francisco that puts on the annual Education Revolution uh, weekend that's coming up in, in April. Uh, so trying to be supportive of groups like that as well. And uh, and what and 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 do you still keep in touch with the students you you've worked with over the years? You know that's a, that's a great question. Uh, a little bit. Sometimes I hear from them at the holidays. Sometimes I hear from them when they come home uh, for a visit. Sometimes their parents kind of keep me in the loop. But you know, part of part of being an educator is at some point the the, the student goes off on their own and. Uh, it would be neat. Uh, you know, some of them have friended me and, you know, part of my network on LinkedIn. So I'm able to keep up with them that way. But, you know, it, it, there is hopefully what, what my what I'm always trying to do is work myself out of a job and have the client be able to work on their own and live a fulfilling and fun life without having to have somebody like me around for for support. If they need if they encounter something that's troublesome for them or problematic or a novel situation that they could use some advice on how to handle. I'm certainly always there for them and glad to glad to help with situations like that. But I'm also glad to hear about their joys at work and their triumphs. And uh, those are things that, uh, that that happen sporadically. But it's it's as any sort of educator can attest. Those those are nice moments. Thank you, Will. Mark, one of the things you've written about is avoiding the spectrum underemployment conundrum. Could you elaborate and tell us about that? Sure. Uh, I think sometimes clients uh, who are new to the job world sometimes overestimate where they should, where their entry point should be. And I think having reasonable expectations, being confident in your abilities, yet understanding that everybody's got to start somewhere is, is important. Uh, I think it's also really important uh, getting as much experience in what you're interested in doing early, uh, understanding what the job requires as far as preparation, whether it's having a professional certifications or college degrees or preparation programs. What do people who are in that job already, what have they done to be prepared? Um, so being aware of that and being realistic about, if, you know, if, if everybody else has to follow a certain path to get to a job, maybe that's a path that I should explore as well. I think it's also important to get in the habit of working. I really uh, uh, counsel people that sometimes having multiple jobs, you know, a part-time job here, a part-time job there, those will all be very helpful when it comes to kind of getting some inertia going as far as uh, having a job and moving from job to job. As the old adage goes, it's always easier to find a job when you have one as opposed to starting from uh, not having any experience. So I think that even, even small things around – you know, around one's home, whether it's walking neighborhood dogs or helping with window cleaning or, or you know, things that you can do necessarily without a bunch of training, that establishes your viability towards being a worker. It shows that you show up on time. It shows that you're responsible. Those are all things that people are looking for as you build your uh, career. I think that the idea of volunteering uh, places in general to sort of have Experiences where people can write you letters of recommendation, that's very helpful. If there's targeted experience to be a volunteer, um, such as if you want to be a, a TV producer one day, maybe uh, volunteering for a, for a public access show and gaining that experience is a great way to get there. I think that having a robust LinkedIn profile, which is uh, kind of Facebook for business, uh, I think is something that even students can start to put together and, and build experience and understanding of LinkedIn. I also think that networking before you need it is very important, letting people know what you're doing, what you're up to, what your goals are, so you can have a bunch of little ambassadors out there in the community that are listening for you and talking to people for you about opportunities that you might not hear about otherwise. Uh, I think taking full advantage of uh, uh, agencies like Department of Rehabilitation or Regional Center or things like that, really being aware of what they can do for you is very helpful and maximizing that if you're a, if you're a client of theirs. And then also something that I'll come back to again for, for other situations, but having a process for researching jobs and for application of jobs, then rather than saying, oh, it just didn't work, you can look back and say, well, you know, maybe my emails weren't tailored enough or maybe I didn't do enough outreach to people. Having a process that you can 
break down and individualize and look at it in a granular sense about what didn't work on your job search it makes it easier to fix that little problem as opposed to feeling like you have to reinvent the entire wheel. So having that process set up is something that is very important to people, neurodiverse, neurotypical, and the whole spe everybody having a process that you can rely on and go back to is I think very, also very important if you want to avoid underemployment. Excellent. Now, you mentioned that very important elements include uh, networking and yeah. outreach. And often, uh, in my experience, uh, I found that even neurotypical people who aren't incredibly outgoing and gregarious often find this difficult. So I would think it, this might be particularly uh, difficult for people on the spectrum. And so what have you found as how to uh, help uh, people on the spectrum deal with these difficulties. Well, I think advice that would help people on the spectrum as, as well as neurotypical folks is to practice your networking pitch. Just the same way as, you know, uh, venture capitalists talk about elevator pitches mm -hmm. where you explain, you know, in the time it takes to go from floor one to floor three on an elevator, what your idea is and why you should be funded. I think that people should have their own sort of elevator pitch about who you are, what you're looking for, and ideally where you'd like to be working that you can put out to people uh, on a moment's notice, not something that you have to think up anew. I think that practicing that and kind of knowing your main points is a very important thing to do and having practice at networking. I think that making a list of the people who you want to network with is important and then going through and checking off when you have done that networking. And networking can take the place of, you know, talking to somebody over coffee. It can take the place of sending a quick email to someone, making sure that they're aware of what you're looking for and your process and what your, uh, what your end goal is, maybe attaching a resume to that so the person can see mm -hmm. what your background is in addition to maybe what they know of you offhand. I think that networking, I think you're exactly right, Keith, that it's something that, that you know, blowing our own horn is something that some people are better at than others, but I think that, you know, targeted blowing your own horn as far as networking and understanding how people can help you uh, is a very important thing. And then also, I, I think sometimes people have a misunderstanding that it's, a, that it's some sort of burden that they're putting on someone else to be looking for jobs for them or doing the work for them. In reality, it's, it's a sign of favor and a sign of respect when you ask someone to help you on your career path. And there's also the expectation that when you get going, there will be some sort of payback in the future. When they're looking yeah. for an opportunity, you can be helpful to them. So it's, it's, it's altruistic, but there is a self-serving moment to it where what comes around goes around. And the further you get in your career, the more you'll be able to help them with a situation that might come up for them in the future. Very practical. Now, you've also mentioned that uh, there are crucial soft skills in the workplace, yes. which again, uh, for neurotypical people, sometimes that can be a bit uh, hard to master mm -hmm. uh, and is particularly uh, difficult for those of us on the spectrum. Could you elaborate a little bit? How can uh, people on the spectrum decode these? Sure. And, you know, decoding is the right word, I think, you know, because, because sometimes it does seem or I would, I would, I've had clients say to me that they feel like there's a, there's a script that they don't have or there's, yeah. there's certain things that, that they're lacking, that there's some sort of secret language that's going on that they're not clued into. And that if you, if you think of it, if you think of it in that way, that can be something that's really deflating and really unencouraging. But my thing is that there's not that. Um, I think that in general, there's a, there's a few pitfalls to avoid as far as conversationally or interpersonally. And if you avoid those, most times people are going to give you the benefit of the doubt and let you be you. Um, I think that it's important to observe, spend a lot of time observing in job situations, especially w if there's a place where you're going to work, kind of see what the people do. What do other people do? And, and maybe focus your thoughts on maybe trying to uh, emulate what they're doing. I think you can let people know your diagnosis and your situation. So if there's a moment where you're not as responsive to them as they might have expected, they understand that it's sort of a condition as opposed to a choice that you're making. And also let them know what you're good at so they can play to your strengths. I think that's nice. Again, there's no one way, there's no one right way to, for soft skills to, to be unleashed on, on a workplace. But I think there's a number of ways that you can learn those skills. Uh, I think... Sometimes watching television shows or movies 
And if there's a moment at work that you don't, that's being portrayed that you don't quite understand or grasp, ask somebody, how do you, what do you, what do you think's going on here? And maybe they can explain things to you that would reveal certain undercurrents that you don't, that you weren't sure about. Uh, I think that's often helpful. Getting back to what I talked about earlier, role playing, I think is very mm-hmm. important as far as working with a coach or with a family member or with a friend about how to handle situations that come up that are new to you. I think that also it's important to have a, I, I kind of think about it as a quiver of arrows. And instead of a, a full of arrows, having a quiver of phrases that you have that you can unleash that you don't have to think of like, hey, that's great. Or at any rate, you know, so things that things that you can say that are kind of verbal placeholders that are not necessarily things that, that continue the conversation, but that, that make sense. I think that having things like conversational templates uh, writing down a conversation that you think could happen and then l- seeing what someone else might say, what you might say in response, what their response might be, that can sometimes be time-consuming, but having that conversational template, looking at it, memorizing it can sometimes be helpful in novel situations. Uh, and I think it's also, uh, I say this uh, based, you know, also what Will was talking about earlier with his shirt, you know, know the local sports scores uh, mm-hmm. and know what the local teams are doing because so often that's sort of a, a soft skill where somebody says, hey, how about those Giants? And if you're not even aware that the season has started, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage. I don't think you have to be necessarily encyclopedic of your knowledge, but just knowing how they're doing, that can be a help too. Well, excellent. Um, along the lines of soft skills, yeah. and it's something that you had mentioned earlier on about uh, revealing your diagnosis. $64,000 question here. At what point in the job hunting or job interviewing process or your job acquisition or your actual job itself should you reveal your diagnosis if you're fairly high functioning and not obvious? You know, that you're, you're right about the $64,000 question. It's also an intensely personal one. Some people are maybe more in touch with their diagnosis and more comfortable. I've had other clients who've said, I don't want to share it because I, I want to I do it on my own. You know, I don't want that to be part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, f- someone like myself is, is going to, what, wherever the client is ready, wherever they feel comfortable, we'll take it as it lies. I think in general, it's better to reveal early than later. Mm-hmm. I think also if you don't reveal it, then some of the benefits that could come from revealing it, such as the employer being sensitized to your unique needs, you can't necessarily expect those things. So if, if, you're, going, if you're making the decision that you're not going to reveal your diagnosis, then you've got to be ready to kind of deal with the ups and downs of work without having an understanding from your coworkers or your supervisors about your unique condition. I think if you are comfortable revealing it, it makes it easier on the whole dynamic. I think you're also starting, you're, you're, you're showing that you're an honest person and you're showing that you want to be open with your, uh, with your colleagues. And I think that that sets a very good trend. But I, I, I don't think there's one way that you have to reveal or you should keep it to yourself. I think it's, it's again, it's an intensely personal thing. And if the, if the client has some practice in revealing and letting the, you know, I mean, we're using that word reveal as if it's some sort of, you know, hidden moment that from behind the cape you reveal something. You know, you're very honest. I think that a way to do it is to be very clear about what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. And then in addition to being clear about the weaknesses, having some ideas, this is what will help me rather than it being a secret. You know, like, for example, being able to, to tape meetings so you mm-hmm. can listen to them later. Um, that seems to me to be a reasonable accommodation that very few businesses would probably have a problem with. But if you don't say that that's something that would help you, they would have no way of understanding that that would be a, a, something that would be beneficial and very, you know, relatively non-intrusive. So that's just one example of how revealing can be helpful to you. But at the same time, uh, if you're if, if you really feel strongly that you want to be an individual that's that's not sort of classified or, or seen as being on the spectrum by your colleagues, uh, I, I guess that's a choice that, that, I, that I respect if clients want to make that choice. Thank you. Sure. I think this is a very interesting and relevant topic, uh, both to myself and to our listeners. Sure. I'd like to explore it a little bit Please. more. Would you advocate 
uh, revealing your condition before you actually are employed, and if so, under what circumstances? Uh, I think... Uh, I think in general, when rather than I don't think it's something that you want to lead with as right. far as when you're applying for a job. I think it's something you can mention in conversation. Uh, you again, that role playing practice I think is crucial mm -hmm. to having a, a rhythm and a comfort to what you're saying, rather than it being the first time that you've ever told someone outside your, uh, you know, close circle about what your situation is. I think that the time to do it is probably before you're hired. Um, so that the so that the business can understand what sort of accommodations that that you're making for yourself, as well as things that they might be uh, able to provide. I think that having you know some clients bring me around as a job coach and introduce me to coworkers and let me know that let them know that I'm going to kind of be sitting in in the afternoon and watching how things go and then giving them feedback on what I saw. So that's not a threatening situation. You know, you can make sure that that's something that the business feels comfortable with. And again, you're bringing, you're showing that you know yourself well. Mm -hmm. I think all these things that we're talking about are, are the same things that employers are looking for on a number of skills. I think that knowing yourself and being able to say what makes you work well and the things that you want to avoid and seeing how the business matches up with that, if it does match up with that, I think is a good idea. It also just sets, a, I think, a precedent of openness. And rather than, than coming, starting a job, not letting people know that there was an accommodation that would benefit you, and then suddenly, you know, six months in, having there be some moment of stress where right. it comes out that, oh, if you would only done this, I'd have done well. Uh, you know, I think it's certainly preferable to that. It, it seems very reasonable and appropriate to reveal after you've been uh, hired, but mm -hmm. before you start, mm -hmm. your condition. My question is about in the interview process, should you reveal it then, unless it's very apparent? Well, that what you just said, I think, is, is crucial. How apparent is it? You know, is it is it something that is going to be on the interviewer's mind and you bringing it up is going to kind of assuage some of their doubts? Or is it something that perhaps, you know, you could quote unquote pass? You know, if, if you were if you were comfortable doing that, I, I just I, I just really if, if it was my point of view, I just really come back to the full explanation Full, but but not making that the the crucial point of the conversation. Yes. I think I think your preparation and your skills in the job at hand are the thing you want to concentrate on, as opposed to you know a perceived negative. Uh, but but letting them know just as they would be sensitive to to needs that people would have as far as family or religion or personal beliefs, having having them sensitized to your neuro needs, I think mm -hmm. is also really important and. I just think that it coming out, you know, oftentimes people who are neurodiverse are going to uh, reveal themselves during a conversation. And if, if you're totally honest about it and get that out, it can be something that's a positive as opposed to it being something where the interviewer knows that there's something else out there that you're not bringing up. But it's something that, well, if they're not bringing this up, what else are they not going to bring up? You know what I mean? Exactly. And so so, again, that that sense of of honesty, of candor of can do -ness, even with mm -hmm. the unique ability, I think is, is something that's only positive. So you're likening it in, in the, for high-functioning individuals to something like the fact that you and I wear glasses. It could be. Yeah, it could okay. be that simple, you know, and it's and, and reasonable accommodations. And then, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but there's also legally things that businesses are not allowed to discriminate based upon. And, you know, neurodiversity mm -hmm. is certainly one of those things. And a reasonable accommodation is just the same as, you know, someone who, you know, is – is non-ambulatory would have the rights to have a, a, an elevator and a door that's wide enough for their wheelchair to come through. I think there are similar accommodations, maybe not as dramatic, but or as obvious, but thing little things that businesses can do that can guarantee them a very motivated and very devoted worker. Uh, and you know, it's interesting that we're having this conversation because just last week the 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 noted uh, uh, entrepreneur Peter Thiel has come out with the advantages of hiring people on the spectrum as far as, you know, not being diverted by 
current fashions or trends and really having a single mindedness and really a devotion to their idea. I think that, you know, those are things that once you start the conversation, you can start talking about those positives that maybe the person didn't really understand. And Mm -hmm. it can, you know, really taking, really taking a, a strong position about what your abilities are, I think can, 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 that's, that's the kind of thing that I think you want the conversation to be about. So like the old song, accentuate the positive. Without a doubt. Let's all sing it. Yes. Excellent. Let's take a brief break here. Great. All right. That was excellent. We're back. Mark, uh, this has been a a fascinating time. And while I routinely say I know we're going to hear a lot more from you, I know we're going to hear a lot more from you because I understand that you're going to be our special correspondent relating to employment issue on the community. So... Thank you very much, and we look forward to many things. It's, it's my pleasure. I'll be glad to come back, and uh, thank you, thank you, Will, and thank you, Keith, uh, for for being such good hosts. You're very welcome. Th- it, no, it was our pleasure. Okay. We were glad to have you. Excellent. And now, Will, uh, I understand you're going to tell us about a couple of upcoming events very relevant to the community. I, I sure am. And these events are happening next Saturday. First event is the Friendship Walk, sponsored by Best Buddies. They they have this walk every year to sponsor their program. It'll be from nine to eleven, and it'll involve it'll and various companies or pro, programs will have will have teams that will walk in in the event, including Holland and Knight, where I work. Excellent. And the next event is the Ascend Brunch, hosted by Ascend itself, at, at the Arc at San Fran- of San Francisco at 11, from 11 to 1. Everyone from Ascend is, inv- is invited. Some, they can even, even some outside of Ascend are invited. The Ascend Brunch also happens every year at the Arc. I would encourage everyone from Ascend or outside of Ascend to to go. It'll be a lot of fun. Should people bring anything to the brunch? They don't have to, but but they're but but they can if they want to. They can bring food, drinks, or desserts. And if if you if they can bring a, a something bring food, that would be great because we need as much as possible. And, and so please bring food. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Good to know and look forward to those events upcoming. This is the part of the show where I tell people uh, this is actually your program. We just run it for you. So in that respect, what we're looking for is you. We would like to see you. We would like to talk with you. If you have some material on video, creative uh, informative, this is what we would love to see. Because as I say, it is your program. You, whether you're being on the spectrum, if you have a loved one or a friend who is part of the spectrum, or if you are a professional, this is your network, this is your program, and we would love to see you and what you have. So for this week, I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Thank you very much, and have a great week. Thank you for... T- t- thank you... Thank you for watching. Tune in next week.